Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's Research Spotlight Talk. My name is Megan Sullivan. I'm a PhD candidate at the Yale School of the Environment, and I'm also the Research Spotlight Assistant for the Peabody Museum. Our Research Spotlight series is the Peabody's Graduate Student Speaker Series. And um, for this series, we spotlight different graduate students who do their research in connection with the museum's collection. Just a few things to note about this special uh, webinar Zoom. We have disabled the chat function for the webinar. So if there's anything you wanna communicate with us or you'd like to ask a question, you can please submit all questions in the Q&A box in the bottom bar of your Zoom window. Um, and you can submit questions at any time during the webinar. So if you're watching the talk and something comes up while you're looking at a particular slide, feel free to submit it as soon as you think of it. Um, we typically do uh, receive many more questions than we're able to answer during the Q&A time. So we apologize in advance if we're not able to get to your question today. And finally, we do have live captioning um, available for this talk. So you can turn on the captions in the bottom right of your Zoom window. So um, I'd like to introduce today's speaker, who is Alejandro Damien Serrano. Um, Alejandro is a biologist from Valencia, Spain, and has a Bachelor of Science in Marine Science from the Institute of Marine Sciences in Barcelona, and he did his PhD in the EEB department here at Yale. He just started a new postdoc at the University of Oregon, and um, his research for his PhD focused on siphonophore evolutionary history, tentacles, prey capture, and diet. Alejandro's talk today will focus on how predatory specialization has developed in siphonophores. So with that, I will pass it off to Alejandro. All right, can you hear me now? I think so. Um, thanks, Megan, for such a kind introduction, and thank you all for being here. Today, I'm going to talk about the work that I did at the Yale Peabody Museum for my doctoral dissertation on the evolution of siphonophore secret weapons for prey capture. Let's start with a broader overview on why evolution and organismal biology are important to ecologists and oceanographers alike. Since one of the most pressing challenges in biological oceanography is to be able to use community composition data, such as the abundances of plankton from a trawl net sample, to predict interactions between species and predict food web structure. They are starting to do this with the help from ecomorphologists who study how organismal traits drive ecological interactions, as in what sizes and characteristics make a suitable prey for a suitable predator. The distributions of these characteristics across biodiversity is better understood on the tree of life, also known as a phylogeny. Phylogenies are interpreted from left to right, from the root of the most recent common ancestor, all the way to the tips that represent modern species alive today. Then comparative biology traces the evolution of traits down these ancestry pathways, allowing us to predict the characteristics of a new species based on its phylogenetic position. So if we know the evolutionary history, we can predict traits. If we can predict traits, we can predict interactions. However, there's two common confounding obstacles that prevent biologists from investigating this pathway. At, a, at an environmental level, local habitat complexity introduces confounding adaptations for each microhabitat that are unrelated to species interactions, such as bodily adaptations to living on a tree or under a rock, uh, like the closely related subterranean moles and tree shrews. At an organismal level, we often find functional pleiotropy. That's when the traits involved in interactions with other species are also under selection for other functions that they carry out. For example, uh, the super sharp eagle claws are being used and optimized by evolution to perch as well as to hunt prey. So in order to investigate the nature of these relationships, I had to find a place where small scale environmental complexity was minimal. And that is the open ocean midwater. And by the midwater, I mean the liquid inner space of the ocean that is far from the surface, 
far from the coasts and far from the bottom. And this actually comprises more than 99% of the planet's biosphere by volume. I also needed a group of organisms with body parts used exclusively for interactions with other species, such as for prey capture, which leads us to siphonophores. Siphonophores form long chains of conjoined specialized bodies that work together as if they were a single animal. Their tentacles carry venomous stinging cells called nematocysts packed into batteries. These batteries are loaded on the side branches of a tentacle called tentilla. Just like the ammunition of a combat plane, tentilla bear a few rocket caliber armor piercing nematocysts and a belt of hundreds of bullet caliber nematocysts. So when an animal like this crustacean becomes entangled in the adhesive terminal filament, things start getting pretty wild as the nematocyst battery rapidly unwinds and slings forward, wrapping around the prey as hundreds of nematocysts fire on it. As soon as the capture happens, the siphonophore reels up the tentacle, bringing the paralyzed prey towards the mouth. Tentilla can be in many different shapes and sizes across the diversity of siphonophore species, with different nematocysts adapted to capturing different prey. Some specialize to capture fish, others to capture crustaceans. But for many of these elusive and understudied species, it is still unknown what prey types their intriguing tentilla designs are targeting. So in summary, siphonophores are an ideal system since they live in a uniform natural laboratory to study the evolution of ecological interactions and present a conspicuous amount of trait variation in their tentilla, which they use exclusively to capture prey. Siphonophores also have a broad variation of prey types as they feed on all sorts of animals from different phyla, such as fish, jellyfish, worms, mollusks, krill, and other crustaceans. For these reasons, siphonophores, here are the ones highlighted in green, are known to play a clearly central role in the open ocean midwater food web. Unlike typical food webs, the midwater one is extremely convoluted and complex. And the big unknown in this scenario was figuring out the evolutionary mechanisms that build up the complexity of this food web. This led to the formation of the collaborative project SIFWeb, focused on studying the effects of predator traits on the structure of oceanic food webs. This project capitalized on an intellectual synergy between experts in evolutionary biology, siphonophore natural history, and midwater ecology across three institutions. Siphonophores are among the largest and most abundant predators in the open ocean, with many different species for which we know almost nothing about their natural history. While siphonophores are an ideal system for my questions, they are extremely fragile creatures, and many of them live hundreds of meters deep. For these reasons, they are extremely challenging to collect and study. In order to get intact specimens, we need to go out into the ocean and collect them alive. This is how I've collected siphonophores in the field. For shallow water species, we use blue water diving, where we dive in the open ocean connected with tethers, as the seafloor lies thousands of meters below. Here we collect siphonophores using jars. In order to collect deep sea species, we use ROVs, which are these large remotely operated submarines that have cameras to observe deep sea animals and use cylinders to collect intact life siphonophores with their surrounding water. The overarching question for today is how do organismal traits and evolutionary history relate to siphonophore diets? To answer this, we need a conceptual framework. On the left side, species evolve to inhabit different regions of the water column and being exposed to different prey. Then species can evolve mechanisms to constrain their distributions to depths where better prey is available. On the right side, species evolve different forms of tentilla for prey capture that are effective at capturing different prey types. Then natural selection can optimize tentilla morphology to specialize on the most rewarding prey. In combination, I hypothesize that these processes lead to phylogenetically structured diets. But today I'm just going to talk about this right side of the model. Starting with chapter one of my thesis, where I explore the evolutionary history of siphonophore specializations and their relationships with tentilla morphology. And this paper was published as the cover of PNAS. To do this, I compiled dietary data from several published sources, including gut content analysis and ROV video observations. Then I categorized them into distinct feeding gills, 
such as the fish specialist in red, gelatinous spray specialist in purple, large crustacean specialist in blue, small crustacean specialist in cyan, and generalists in green, who would feed on a balanced variety of hard and soft-bodied prey. Then I built a molecular phylogeny comparing shared genetic mutations using gene sequences and then reconstructed the evolutionary history of these specializations. The theoretical expectation was to find specialists evolving from generalist ancestors and then becoming unable to evolve into anything else due to the constraints that are typically associated with extreme adaptations to a singular prey type. Like, for example, when the ancestral opportunist mammal evolved into all these different forms, like the tongue twisting anteaters or the hypsodont grand grass eaters, like horses. What I found in siphonophores, however, is quite different. I realized that siphonophore specialists appear to have evolved from ancestral specialists on different prey, and that generalists, the ones in green, are derived twice at least from specialists. The fact that siphonophores can easily evolve from one predatory specialization into another or into generalism seems a bit counterintuitive. And this is because most predators in the seminal papers in the theory are like vertebrates with a prey capture apparatus that is integrated into the body. For example, the mouth is built into a fish's skull and it's used for ventilation and sometimes territorial behavior as well as feet. So changing the shape of the mouth requires changes in the whole musculature system for feeding, breathing, sometimes even locomotion. And therefore these species cannot simply decide to, oh, I'm going to evolve a new morphology for prey capture or at least not in isolation. On the other hand, siphonophore tentilla are spatially, developmentally, and functionally decoupled from all the other anatomical structures. And therefore, they can evolve more freely. The take home here is that studying unfamiliar and weird invertebrates can actually change our perspective on fundamental ideas in evolutionary biology. At the Peabody Museum, I extensively imaged and characterized the morphology of siphonophore gentilla using complementary microscopy approaches. For example, I use uh, laser confocal microscopy scanning to obtain a 3D overview like this one we see, and also differential interference contrast to examine individual nematocyst types. I owe the success of my morphology and microscopy work to the generous support and help from Lourdes and Eric of the Invertebrate Zoology Division. From these images, I took 30 different measurements and ratios of things like, for example, lengths and widths for tentilla and nematocysts as traits to be analyzed, which in comparative biology are referred to as characters. I measured all the different types of nematocysts that can be found in tentilla, such as the piercing heteronemes and haplonemes and the adhesive desmonemes and ropalonemes in the terminal film. Among these measurements was the volume of these stenotyl nematocysts, which as far as my record checking has gone, constitutes the largest nematocyst and the largest intracellular organelle of all living things. Using these morphological data I collected, I wanted to find out what patterns of tentil evolution were associated to evolutionary shifts in dietary specializations, especially differences in the realized morphology changes in the optima that evolution is drawn towards, and changes in the evolutionary correlations between traits. By comparing the evolutionary histories of tentillum characters and diet, I found that siphonophores, as, as siphonophores evolve from one predatory specialization into another or into generalism, their tentilla and nematocysts also drastically change shape and size. For example, both fish specialist lineages here in red have independently evolved more rounded nematocysts, more spherical. I wanted to assess whether the adaptive optima of morphological evolution itself actually shifted with diet. So for every morphological character, I fitted a null model that was like neutral divergent evolution and then compare this to a selection based model with these optima, optimum states of morphology that would shift with each dietary regime. 
I found several characters that fitted these diet driven models significantly better than the neutral model. Here are a few examples. Um, these traits have sig signatures of natural selection that are driving their evolution toward different adaptive states corresponding to each feeding guild. Here you can see a matrix of morphological characters, both on the X and the Y, where black means no correlation, beige is high positive correlation, and cyan means high negative correlation between the rates of evolution. Highly correlated traits tend to change in the same way, like the way that the arms and legs uh, of mammals are correlated across their evolutionary history. For the whole siphonophore tree, what we're seeing here, we can see that the rates of evolution between traits are highly correlated. But are these correlations constant across the phylogeny or do they also change with the changing diets? Now to answer this, I compare the whole tree matrix like this one to matrices within specific dietary regimes. For example, here is the matrix fitted for the regions of the tree occupied by fish specialists. At a glance, it's hard to see any difference with what I saw show you before. But when I subtract the fish specialist matrix from the whole tree matrix, the differences appear highlighted as increases or decreases, just deviations in these correlations coefficients. And if these are showing us exactly which pairs of traits have dependencies that are unique to the specialization and are not general. What's even more interesting is when we compare fish specialists to their immediate ancestors, the large crustacean specialists. Now these differences are even more striking and they represent the actual evolutionary change in the relationship. And we see strong changes in the relationship between nematocyst shaped characters, for example, which correspond to some of these blue dots in the heat map. So we have seen that siphonophore generalists can evolve from specialists. And with these shifts in specialization, we not only get morphological evolution, but we also get changes in the adaptive optima and changes in the correlations between characters themselves. The results from chapter one have shown that diet has a strong influence on the evolution of tentilla morphology, that green arrow there. Uh, this elicited many more questions on how tentilla evolved, and this led to expand this research into chapter two on the evolutionary processes leading to the current diversity of tentilla morphologies. This paper is now published at the Journal of Integrative Organismal Biology. We have seen that different siphonophore species have very different tentilla morphologies. Some are coiled, others are straight. Some are enclosed in a membrane called an involucrum. That's the blue stuff there. Um, and some species have fluorescent and bioluminescent lures to attract prey. And not only their shapes are diverse, but tentillum sizes themselves can range all the way from 40 micrometers to eight centimeters. Th that is 40,000 micrometers or 80,000 actually. So the primary goal of this chapter was to provide a descriptive phylogenetic roadmap of the major novelties, such as changes in size, changes in nematocyst types, tentillum shape, and modifications to the terminal lure to attract prey. When we summarize morphological variation into a principal components analysis, we see that much of this variation is explained by tentillum and nematocyst size. These are heavily loaded principal components that are indicating low dimensionality, and they also have a high phylogenetic conservatism, which could be a consequence of phenotypic integration. And phenotypic integration is when different parts of a complex structure maintain evolutionary correlations a long time. To test for phenotypic integration, I examined the multivariate phylogenetic correlations between different character modules, including different nematocyst types and also general tentillum shape attributes as a single module. Uh, the colors here go from black, meaning no integration, to beige, representing strong, significant integration. I found significant evolutionary correlations among most of them, indicating this integration. But the thing is that phenotypic integration can happen for different reasons. Uh, the most common and kind of trivial one being developmental correlations and constraints among structures that develop together 
under the same tissue, cell signaling, cascade, regulatory networks, et cetera. But the surprising thing here is that I found integration signal between Tantilla and nematocysts, which is not really congruent with developmental dependencies if we take into account how Tantilla are made. Because Tantilla bud at the very base of the tentacle, but then th they develop as tentacle growth pushes them further away from the base. Like other Cnidarians, Siphonophore Tentilla subdue prey using nematocysts, which need to be assembled and loaded. At the base of the feeding bodies, Siphonophores produce specialized cells that carry the nematocysts, called nidocytes. Developing nidocytes travel down the tentacle and are building their nematocysts inside the cell, changing its shape and size as they go. Once they reach the tentillum, meters away sometimes, they sort themselves by type, squeeze into the epidermal layer, settle into their peritoneum position, and then rotate to point this harpoon outwards. And only when they're loaded, the outer layer twists around the central axis into its final conformation, determining tentillum shape. So the developments of tentillum shape and nematocyst shape and size, et cetera, are spatially independent which makes finding phenotypic integration between them exceptionally interesting because it could mean that they're adaptively correlated due to functional reasons. And this makes sense since Stentilla and their nematocysts have to coordinate like clockwork to deliver a precise strike in a few milliseconds. Nematocyst discharge is the fastest accelerated motion among all biological phenomena. Funded by the Yale Institute of Biospheric Sciences, I set out to record high-speed footage of tentillum and nematocyst discharge across several species and investigated how changes in the morphology correlate with changes in kinematic performance. These are just uh, impressions on a few dozens of, of observations because obtaining these high-speed videos under a microscope out in a moving boat in the middle of the ocean was extremely challenging. Also, it's really hard to get in taxiphonophores out there. So we kind of lack the amount of data and replication needed to carry out conclusive evolutionary analysis. But we did find some pointers out there. So on the top side, you're, you're looking at the tentillum discharge of three different siphonophore species with their corresponding static confocal image underneath. And these are ordered left to right by coiledness. Now, I found that coiled tentilla had relatively faster strikes. And this is hinting at a potential tension release mechanism associated with the way they're coiled during development. However, the straighter tentilla had nematocysts with significantly faster shooting speeds at the subcellular level than the, than the ones from the coiled tentilla. And uh, perhaps now they're compensating for a lack of speed at the tentillum level with speed at the nematocyst level. These videos also reveal unique dynamic features of some species, such as the spiral discharge behavior of Frilagalma nematocysts, which might drill themselves into prey like a corkscrew, providing a form of anchor. And we still have no idea what this species needs. In chapter one, we saw that haplonym nematocyst shape becomes wider in fish specialists. But can we conclude that these morphological shifts evolved convergently? Now, to test this idea, I fit a multi-optimum model that also evaluates which evolutionary regimes are the same and convergent. The colors of the branches indicate the evolutionary regime that they belong to. This graph on the right shows the haplonym length and width for modern species as these small circles, as well as the position of the evolutionary regime optima as these larger circles. I found that both fish specialists the ones shown in cyan, there's two different clades, had convergently evolved wider nematocysts. But something that I didn't expect to find in this analysis is that small crustacean specialists, the ones in yellow, had also convergently evolved, this time into extremely narrow nematocysts at the other end of the spectrum. So in conclusion, I found that tentillum shape and different nematocyst types are phenotyp phenotypically integrated in among and that is likely by means of natural selection to improve their synergistic function. I found that until in size and shape can predict how fast it fires for different components of it fire, although we do need more data to be conclusive about this. Finally, we saw that some morphological adaptations such as nematocyst shape have evolved convergently to be effective 
uh, the capturing of the same prey type. Thinking back to the main question, we have seen that siphonophores can evolve out of their ancestral specialization and that they do so thanks to the tintilla that can evolve adaptively, convergently, and integratively following the needs imposed by their diets. In this way, siphonophores have evaded the constraints of specializations, and they have become the kingpins of the midwater food web. This is all I have for you today. Uh, I would like to thank all of the funding sources that have made this research possible and all the people who have contributed in this research in one way or another and who guided me through this journey. Uh, special thanks to the Yale Peabody Museum and Vertebrate Zoology Collections that currently houses all of the vouchers and specimens that I used throughout my dissertation and is in fact currently the largest siphonophore collection in the world. And thank you all for your attention and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Alejandro, for that wonderful and interesting talk. I loved all of the animations and the videos that you had of your organisms and um, of your dives. Uh, <laughs> one of the questions that I had um, was those pictures are so beautiful, even your background right now where you have the divers in the background is really cool. Um, and so I was wondering, uh, where do you do your dives and do siphonophores only live in certain oceans or do they live all over the world? Yeah, and, uh, thank you. And uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, siphonophores do live in every ocean of the world and in most of the seas, including the Mediterranean. Um, and they do, you can find them everywhere from the surface, like the Portuguese man of war all the way. Some are in like attached and tethered to the seafloor and the, like the abyssal seafloor, like more than 4,000 meters deep. Um, the thing is that the diving logistics, that, that depends sometimes on uh, other things, like where are the ships and where, where is it easier to dive. During my PhD that uh, was uh, partly at Brown University and partly at Yale, uh, we have done some local dives uh, with a lab and gone off uh, Block Island, especially during the fall, that there's a peak where you can find them more frequently in a way that you get more uh, time for your buck or however you say that. Um, but then I've been also diving with the collaborators in the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute and that is of Central California. So we leave from there and then it's off the Monterey Bay, kind of that California current area. It's very, very rich in gelatinous plankton. But my favorite and the ones that are in the pictures that I tend to uh, share are the dives in Hawaii. So either off a ship that departs from Honolulu or uh, recently my current job, we're uh, doing field work off the coast of uh, Kona, the big island. And that is like the water is much clearer and, and you find like a, a big diversity of siphonophores, but yeah, you can find them anywhere. For sure. Okay, great. Thanks for that. Um, I did just want to mention that I saw um, at least one hand up in the attendees. So if you do have any questions, please put them in the Q&A and uh, I'll read them out for you. Uh, so we do have a couple in the Q&A queue right now. One um, from Beverly says, how does the shape of the nematocyst? Um, and she says, I think you said round ones were used in fish predation, um, facilitate the capture of the particular prey. So fish versus large or small crustaceans. Yeah, uh, thank you, that really, that, that's a good question. There is some speculation about that that was published uh, a while ago that uh, I then picked up um, in my own research. Um, so the thing is that typically most nematocysts are pretty round because most nematocysts are used for penetration. And the, the shape of the capsule affects the way that the that the, the pressure differential that in many cases, uh, the ways that has been studied is through osmotic discharge. So these capsules contain a different uh, osmolarity, just think of it as salinity than the surrounding cellular environment. And there is like a trigger, a subcellular trigger when, when they're like about to, to shoot. And then the, they fill in with, with uh, ambient water. And this kind of like a glove that you blow on like the finger shoot out, that kind of thing is how the filam filament comes out. Um, so for cnidarians uh, like, you know, that 
like siphonophores that, that are trying to penetrate uh, a tissue, which is something that makes sense when the tissue is relatively penetrable, like the, the skin of a fish, they are maximizing that penetrative uh, ability. So they wanna reduce the surface to volume ratio of that capsule for the physical force. But the thing is that there's two different hypotheses to what's going on with the, with the ones that are very, very different that are only found in siphonophores and in some uh, anthozoans like uh, corals and stuff. And the super narrow ones in siphonophores, they're probably maximizing packing. So they just want to pack more, more of those. And since they can't really penetrate uh, many of the crustaceans exoskeletons, it's kind of a pointless feud to try to like maximize that. So instead they have like these super long filaments that come out of them with a lot of barbs and spines. So crustaceans in their appendages are also kind of feathery so that they can get entangled very easily. And like when, when a tentillum explodes, especially with those that are a crustacean specialist, you see like this cotton candy of filaments coming everywhere. And it might not even be through toxicity that they paralyze the prey. They just like are everywhere. They completely entangle it. Uh, and yeah, but they don't need to optimize that much for uh, penetration, which is uh, the, the main hypothesis for those differences. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I have one question here that's asking, can independent traits evolve convergently if they are not affected by the same pressures of natural selection? Mm. So a bit more of a theoretical evolutionary question. Yeah. Yeah, I'm worried about answering wrong in case that the <laughs> evolutionary biologists in the room are going to remove my PhD or something. But <laughs> as far as I think I understand conversion evolution, it is by definition talking about the same selective pressures. Like it is the, the usual examples are talking about two distantly related. Uh, oh, but I, the question is, is complicated because you're saying independent traits. Conversion evolution definitely always refers to the same trait. It just has, uh, it just, they just come from different, um, you know, original like ancestral values of where they are. And then like, they are affected by the same pressure and then they end up being like, you know, we're gonna change this way. Oh, we're over here, but we're gonna change this way. And they end up converging into this optimal state that happens to be very useful for that particular okay. trait. So um, like the pathway or the mechanism might be different, but it ends yeah. up in the same place. Okay. Yeah, but I'm pretty sure that, yeah, that it, it, yeah. It only makes sense to talk about conversion evolution if we're talking about the same uh, type of, of end goal. Although there might be like, I mean, your question can be interpreted in many different ways. <laughs> I think that, because you could be saying that yeah, the natural selection might be acting differently, even though the end goal is the same and acting on the current state of the trade differently. And I think that would still be considered uh, uh, converged. But I think this is just getting really deep into the nitty gritty. <laughs> well, yes, I think it gives uh, everyone a good sense of how complicated maybe some of these uh, concepts are to think about yeah. and like pull apart and understand. Um, yeah. But thank you for that exercise. Uh, one other question here, uh, what are siphonophores natural enemies and what are they the prey to? Or what are they prey to? Sorry, yes. That is a great question. We have a, a literature review paper uh, that is currently under uh, editorial review uh, about that. Uh, just looking at like everything that siphonophores eat and who eats them. And they do have a lot of predators for sure. Um, Different siphonophores have different predators, but generally they have either just general gelativore, like uh, animals that eat gelatinous animals. Like there's a lot of fish, like the ocean sunfish that eat gelatinous animals. Um, they have these uh, parasites that are these crustaceans called hyperid amphipods that sometimes will like feed on them. The squat lobster larvae will, will feed on them or sometimes just like pluck off parts and use them as like floating habitat while they eat them. And then there's this, I guess, to give like one very interesting example is this a very super specialized uh, slug, sea slug called cephalopygy uh, that starts at the, at the 
the tip of each tentacle and starts like munching on them until it eats the whole, like its favorite part is the most dangerous part of the animal. And they, they don't care. They, are, they figure it out, how to still devour them. That's but, yeah. very impressive, yeah. Um, there's another question here. Um, are there any recorded cases of arms races between siphonophores and their prey? For example, uh, an arms race between increasing armor of target crustacean species and siphonophore specialist species? Yeah, that is, a, that is one of the questions that I wanted to explore in my, in my thesis, but it's a little unfeasible to do currently, mostly because the, so A, we don't, you need to have a parallel time scale. So you need to be able to map the evolution or the, or the you know, common ancestors of the prey in the same absolute time as those changes are happening in siphonophores. Siphonophores have no fossils. So uh, this phylogenetic tree is a little wobbly when it comes to estimating absolute time. And the thing is that the time scale at which their prey uh, diversified or like the different preys that they eat, how dif distantly related like a, a, like a crustacean is from a fish or either is from a jellyfish is very likely at a much deeper evolutionary time scale than the time scale at which siphonophores then like start diversifying. Oh, you eating that? I don't want to compete with you. I'm just going to go and feed on this other thing that also exists in my environment. But these changes could have been like, you know, hundred million years ago versus the divergences between these animals are like 800 or more million years ago. Okay. So, so it's wish. kind of hard to find the time scales that line yeah, up perfectly think, to answer this kind of question. Yeah, I mean, and the thing is that the midwater food web is super complicated. Like, prey don't have siphonophores as their single enemy. Everything out there that is eaten by siphonophores is also eaten by a lot of other things. So they, the arms race will become easily diluted because they have so many different predators that attack them from so many different ways. So like, I wish that would be a really, a really beautiful thing to study, but I think it's, would be very difficult. Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, let's see, uh, Christine asks, once they've been used to capture a prey, do the filaments and bullets get regenerated? Yeah, that's such a great question. Very, very good question. Because, um, so, okay, when, when the tantillum explodes and all the nematocysts like fire and wrap around the prey and all this stuff, and the and the and it goes up to the mouth and the mouth of the feeding body ingests the prey, it also like nips off like the stem of the tantillum and ingests the whole thing. We don't know what happens there, but like those the materials that they use to build these weapons are very expensive, biologically speaking. And it would make a lot of sense if they recycle a bunch of them. Uh, to make uh, new nematocysts, new tentilla, et cetera. One sec. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so, but the thing is that tentilla do regenerate, but they don't regenerate at the place where they were missed. They keep budding new ones. Kind of like, you know how teeth keep uh, replenishing in, in sharks? Like they make little teeth on the back of their palate and they keep growing and making new ones as the front ones keep being worn out and, and, and disused. Like, that's what uh, what Tintil are doing. They're budding new ones that they're reaching maturity as they grow down the tentacle and replace the new ones. Yeah. Great. Um, and then Mike asks, uh, first of all, he said, great presentation and research, really interesting. And he asks, uh, are you continuing your research and what is your current assignment? Uh, yeah, thank you. I, I finished my PhD at Yale at the end of August of uh, this year, and I just started. I've been uh, only for um, a couple of months here as a postdoctoral uh, researcher in the Institute of Ecology and Evolution in the University of Oregon in Eugene with uh, the lab of Kelly Sutherland. And I'm currently not studying siphonophores. I'm studying salps, which is another completely different group of gelatinous, uh, long colony forming uh, animals in the open ocean. But the questions that I'm focused on now is more how these, uh, these colonies have different architectures. They're not all like a chain. They can have other forms and looking at how efficient their uh, multi-jet propulsion is uh, through the water and how that is related to their needs to migrate vertically, et cetera. So, yeah. 
Thanks. Cool. Well, I think you have found your niche in gelatinous, uh, interesting, <laughs> sort of strange uh, ocean animals to study. It's very clear your passion comes through through your talk and when you're answering your questions. Um, so I think we're almost out of time here today. Um, and I just want to say a couple of things to wrap up um, before we end. Um, so please do follow us on social media. You can stay in touch by signing up for our mailing list at the bottom of the Peabody website. We would like to make sure that all of you know about our upcoming online programs. And we are going to continue to do this series next semester. So keep an eye out for the spring schedule as it comes. Um, in the meantime, I hope everyone has a wonderful winter break and holiday season. Uh, thank you again to Alejandro for your wonderful presentation today. So glad we could have you here um, and see all of your beautiful photos and animations. Uh, and thanks to everyone in the audience for being here as well. I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of your Thursday. Thank you, Megan.